Okay, I think we're live. All right. What is up, guys? Uh, comment a quick yes in live chat if you can hear us. I'm here today with Eric, and we are going to be going over his journey, uh, as well as answering any questions that you guys have in the uh, live chat itself with regards to agency building, cold email, uh, LinkedIn content marketing as well, which Eric is an absolute beast at. Oh and uh, anything else that uh, essentially comes your way. So uh, just comment a quick yes if you can hear us, just the uh, sound check so that we don't end up doing a 20 minute live stream on mute. And uh, we'll kick it off super quick. I see you've already got one question. Uh, well, people are asking a lot of stuff with regards to recession, which makes sense considering the times that we're in right now. I, I have for sure thoughts about that. Um... Yeah. For sure. Do you want to talk about that right now? Um, sure. I mean, it is like the it is the the the, the flavor of the times, along with yeah. the other things that are going so on. I I am actually looking so forward to a recession. Uh, and the reason I say that is, when you started in this game, it was like you needed to have your Google domains, your G Suite. You were using maybe Quick Mail to get this done. I don't even know what email sending software you were using when you started. Um, the, the expense was so high to get started in this like cold email game. Um, geez, quick mail charges 30, 40, $50 an inbox. Now you have instantly, which you can have as many inboxes as you want or smart lead, uh, you know, uh, you have those two as many inboxes as you want. You have Zoho works perfectly. So we've cut the cost of inboxes by a fifth. You have find email. Apollo, Lead IQ, all of these softwares that you can hack and then get more emails out of them than than they think that you're getting. I have an Apollo account for twenty dollars and I get ten thousand emails a month. The the cost to come into this is lowering and lowering and lowering, which is making it easy for other people to enter the game. And then it's also um, causing you know. I don't even really see it as competition and we'll talk about why I don't see it as competition, but for everybody who wants to take this seriously, it's, it's competition for them. And so with a recession, hopefully what will happen is the people who can't stay in the game, they're not good enough. They're not uh, actually cut out to be a founder. They're not cut out to be a salesperson. They're not cut out to be in the cold email game. We'll get flushed out and they'll have to go do something else. And, uh, the, the recession is the only thing that will cause that uh, because the barrier to entry just keeps lowering and lowering and lowering. And this recession will just kind of clean out all of those things. So for but, anybody, oh yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's a couple of points with regards to what you mentioned. I think it's a pretty interesting conversation. Um, you mentioned a decreasing barrier to entry, which typically in markets leads to oversaturation of the market itself. So you, you stated that that would be a good thing coming from the recession that the barrier to entry would lower the reset so the barrier to entry has already lowered the the instantly AppSumo drop but it basically broke the growth hacking boot camp like everybody went nuts it was, it was crazy um so the barrier to entry has already dropped what will happen is the recession will clean out all the people who can't who can't hang quote unquote mm -hmm. you see the same thing with with real estate agents so in america i don't know how it is by you uh there are so many real estate agents that the competition gets crazy and crazy and crazy and then the recession comes and just wipes out everybody and they, and they can't they can't hang and now the real estate agents who could weather that storm get through and and they can you know acquire customers at the other end of it much easier i think the, the so now one thing that's a huge benefit for what we do coming into a recession is We've cracked the code, especially with the the tips that you give in the the growth hacking boot camp. Where it a lot, I what I see a lot of people doing wrong in their agencies is they are framing it as I will get you fifteen to twenty meetings a month, and you know that's their frame is I will deliver on these results. Where if you take a step back and you know. Of course, that's a great guarantee, but also sometimes you could be setting yourself up for failure because you also are taking on a lot of risk. You're taking on their product risk. You're taking on their market risk. You're taking on uh, their competition risk. You're taking on their branding risk. There's all of these risks that you're taking on uh, that when you have these guarantees, yes, they're great to close deals, but there's a lot of risks that you have to manage as well. And so uh, that you actually have no control of. Uh, that That is your your clients, you know, all of your clients' problems. So instead of framing it as I will get you these meetings, framing it as 
well, I'm a turbocharged SDR. And they kind of have this, you know, okay, what should I do? Hire a full-time person that I need to pay health insurance for and I need to put them on payroll or hire this agency where they're going to do the same thing, but much faster. And having that frame control is where you can, is, is where I think people who can control that frame in a sales conversation are going to have much more success in the recession because it is a cost reducing service that is right next to revenue. And so as, as long as you can frame it in a way that you could still get paid and not give everything away in a guarantee, you could still thrive in a recession because their option is hire a full-time person or hire an agency. Which one are they going to do? Um, so barrier to entry is being lowered. Recession is going to clean people out. Key takeaway, though, is is if you can control your frame and your sales processes, you'll still be able to thrive. I agree 100%. I, that's also something that I mentioned, I've mentioned. i been mentioning over and over again. I think the people that are going to thrive during a recession period or a depression period are people that can work on a performance basis and that can also deliver the results as well. Because even big agencies that hit the six to seven figure mark, they don't do it with retainers. They do it with a setup fee plus a performance based agreement, which essentially just generates more revenue for them as they generate more revenue for a client. Because the only clients that you can close for a uh, 200,000 retainer is maybe Nike or Adidas. You're, you're not gonna close your SMB for like a, a 100K retainer unless, I don't know, something's like uh, terribly wrong. But uh, apart from this conversation, let's uh, let's essentially start it from uh, sure, the, yeah. the, 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 the bottom up. How did you get started? So we're the same age. I don't want to disclose my age on on on, on video, and uh, it's so that I won't tell my age either. Too, you yeah. can't either. Uh, but um, how did you get started? Like from the moment that you essentially like, I don't know what the 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 age of like um, of being an adult is in America. I'm guessing it's like 18, where your parents just kick out of the yeah, house. 18, they're like, yeah, yeah, they're like, go do your own thing. Uh, how did you like? What's your story from there? Like, did you go? You finished school. You went straight to university. What did you do? Yeah, so I finished school. I went straight to university. It was actually so funny. I had a full ride uh, to a school in Boston, and I hated it. I, I just could not. I I I love the city of Boston, but I just couldn't stand that school. So I left. Uh, it, it was crazy as I had three full rides leading leaving high school uh because i was a pretty good student and then i went back home and what people don't tell you is when you leave college you you don't get any of those scholarships so went back home i had to go to community college um which was actually the biggest blessing ever I, do you have community college over there is that even a familiar thing uh community college is like where the broke kids go yeah exactly so i had to go to community college. yeah that's which, like sort of what i went to as well but oh, like, okay yeah a different country so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. which was actually a blessing because um uh, they don't check your work. Like you have no homework. You just, I, I just worked. So I, I actually became a gymnastics coach. Um, then I started working for a startup and then that startup actually, and this is where I got so close to entrepreneurship is right after college. I, and then I went to a four-year school as well, but then right after college, I joined a startup and the whole thing got acquired in a year. It was, the, I didn't even really realize what I was watching because I was so young. I just thought, oh, okay, this is just the way things happen. But then as I, I got into the world, I, I really realized that getting acquired in a year was actually very difficult for that founder to do, and he should be extremely proud for doing that. Then I started working for a chamber of commerce, which is kind of like a uh, government advocate for businesses in the United States. And um, really, I was just advocating for uh, healthcare reform, uh, energy reform, and transportation reform well, and education reform in the United States. And they uh, came to me and they said, oh, you need to sell. Uh, you know, the last person who had your job, they sold. So you need to figure out how to sell. So I started reading all these books. Um, then somebody taught me how to, if I were to send emails through my Outlook account, I could do a mail merge from Excel to a Word document to Outlook and send emails through my Outlook account automatically that didn't have the HTML thing on it. And so then that's where I got started in lead generation because I think I sent 200 emails to people who wanted me to email them. This, this was not a cold list. They said they wanted me to email them. I booked, I think, like 80 meetings off of that one email blast. And I was like, this is awesome. Um, so from there, I just wanted to keep learning as much as I could because I it just I talked to everybody about it. They're like, how'd you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I just used automation. I don't, I don't even know what I just did. Were you considered the government worker? Uh, so we would be considered, we are actually technically nonprofit workers. Um, I was not a government worker, no. Um, so then we we would do that. 
Oh, and then an incubator came to me. And then this is where I really got interested in your stuff is an incubator came to me and they said, hey, stop doing what you're doing for the Chamber of Commerce. This is a nonprofit. You're going to go. No, like you've got a ceiling. Come do this for tech companies within our incubator. So I was running these outbound campaigns for 10 to 20 people at a time. And uh, this is where I really actually found your stuff was because then they came. So I went to them and I said, hey, you know what kind of marketing budgets do we have? And they're like, ah, you got to really be as scrappy as you possibly can. We don't really have huge marketing budgets. And so I was, I changed my frame of mind of instead of, okay, how can we run a full blown marketing campaign to how could I multiply one person to do the work of 10 or 20 people, which is then where I found a lot of your stuff was using the automation to reach out to these people, scraping the email addresses, all of those things. Um, and so then that's, I think where I got pressured to start, getting into like the big leagues of doing this stuff. And that's also where I was able to test a lot of things to see what was working, what wasn't working. Cause I was running so many campaigns at once. You could kind of tell what was working, what wasn't working. Um, and then a partner uh, who today I'm still partnered with uh, came to me and said, Hey, you know, let's break this off and let's start our own thing. Uh, and he has a, another huge business partner as well. And so then we, uh, I just left the uh, the incubator to then start the agency. Okay, so, so you left the incubator to start the agency uh, during the incub like whilst you're working at the incubator. What's your like knowledge level at? Um, like, how 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 well versed would you say you are with B two B automation at that point? At that point, I knew basically I knew how to use Apollo, hook up G Suite uh, accounts to Apollo, and I knew, uh, I would say B2B automation was Apollo. And it, you have a video on how to scrape LinkedIn profiles for open email addresses. That was probably the, the extent of my knowledge. It was it was past where a lot of people were. I would still show people what I was doing and they, they thought, wow, this is crazy. I'd never seen this before. Past that, but nowhere near of the stuff that we're doing today. It's crazy how the B2B field is so antiquated when it comes down to the level of knowledge with regards to automation. And, and I think the reason for that, and sorry to cut you off, but I think the reason for that is because of the B2B buyer experience. So you have this very Henry Ford style, one person does one thing, the other person does the other thing, the other person does the other thing. And so in most B2B companies, it's the sales development representative sets the meeting, the account executive closes the deal, and then the uh, customer success person manages the relationship to ensure they don't churn. Nobody wants to be a sales development rep. Every single sales development rep is looking to become an account executive. And even customer success managers are looking to become an account executive, right? And so I think that's why it's so antiquated is because nobody wants to get good at the job. They want to put in the reps in order to just get to account executive. And then they, they just want to leave. And th there's even TikTok videos I see all the time. I think Will Aiken just posted something like this where, you know, the account executive did a four call close on a $500,000 deal. And the SDR who got the meeting got a $50 gift card. It's like, that's crazy that, you know, you did all of the work to get them into the door and the account executive with good product market fit closed a $500,000 deal. And they're the only ones who get the commission. I, I personally, I think that's nuts. Uh, but I think that's why it's so antiquated. Nobody cares. They, they, they don't care to learn. They just need to get their 10, 15 meetings a week and then, or a month, I mean, just to hit their quota. And then they don't care about up leveling after that. Would you say that a factor that contributes to just how antiquated it is, is basically the divide between sales and marketing? Because like for B2B, right, uh, for let's say the people who take sales calls, they essentially categorize themselves as sales. They don't categorize themselves as the people uh, responsible for the marketing. They don't do the ad campaigns. They don't do the outreaches. They just push it to marketing. Do you think the divide between the two compartments like sort of uh, like fuels the problem even more? Yeah. So I would say so for sure, because also when you read a marketing book, they will go over a lot of these things and they'll go over copyright. I actually think copywriting is probably the most important thing that you could even learn. All of the other things, just just go to the Growth Hacking Bootcamp, learn how to do the technicalities and just do that. And then just focus on copywriting after that. Legitimately, that's just become a student of copywriting. Um so the so marketers they get this stuff they understand oh what if i pull on this lever what if i do this what if i do this because the books that you can read on marketing go over those things but then you look at sales books 
probably the best prospecting book out there right now is fanatical prospecting and no automation, no data uh, discussions, no uh, AI discussions, no leveraging LinkedIn discussions. It, he literally is just saying, pick up the phone, dial hundred people a day, send 50 emails, send 20 LinkedIn messages, wake up tomorrow, do the same thing. And it, no discussion around how to do it better. I mean, the copywriting, yeah, he talks about, but there, there's no discussion on, on how to how to scale that, how to do it better. Um, so I think it's just, it's for sure the difference between the, the ways of thinking in the departments. Do you think this stuff still works? Like the fanatical prospecting thing where it's essentially a numbers game and you, you, you grind it out? Or do you think there's smarter ways to do that? So I'm always of the mind that there's smarter ways to do it, but it still comes down to a numbers game. It's all about what levers can you pull on to make the numbers work better in your favor. Um, so... You know, if you're getting a 10% open rate, it's it's definitely a numbers game still, uh, but you could pull on your email deliverability lever and d- write the same emails and just send it out. I knew one person who used Smart Leads, literally just their guide. They were sending cold emails from HubSpot. They used Smart Leads guide, 3x their conversion on the same email, and their email is garbage too. I, I read it and it was absolute trash, but they still 3x their conversion because their deliverability was better. So... It's absolutely a numbers game, but you have to think about, okay, what optimization can I make here? What optimization can I make here? We have, um, I did an A-B split test of split testing e-com stores. Hey, e-com store, do you want to, do you want to sell your e-com store? I have buyers. Are you interested? And then the other email we sent was, uh, hey, Kirill, notice that you've been running XYZ e-commerce store since 2014. Would you be interested in selling it? I have buyers, blah, blah, blah. P.S. I noticed you live in Cyprus. Have you ever tried this restaurant? And the uh, literal five x increase in in responses just by personalizing those two things. Um, so, so yeah, it's absolutely still a numbers game, but you have to approach it as it's an activity numbers game. And once you have and once you have your daily activity, how can you pull levers to optimize your daily activity? Right. Got you. Now let's uh, l- uh, l- let's move into the the agency segment. So, what exactly do you do right now with the agency itself? Who do you service, and uh, what's your focus? So it's always it's always B two B companies. Um, and I say B two B companies because I really don't like processing and trying to land in the inbox of personal email addresses. It's just way yeah, harder. No. I just I just don't even want to do it. Especially uh, cold. Uh, yeah, especially cold. Yeah. Um, straight cold email we were doing a lot of things where we used to have like all of these fake linkedin accounts we were trying to manage all this stuff i think we were even talking about that at one point and we were trying to manage all this stuff i was even reaching out to models um in other countries in like germany to then get them to make accounts that we could use and then they would verify it it was just it was just this like crazy mess and so we got out of that and all we do is just uh cold email there's going to be a huge cold calling campaign that we're managing pretty soon uh, as well, but that I just support on the data side of that, not not the actual like picking up the phones and and doing the calling. Uh, but I'll be doing all of the data for that. So it's basically big data projects of okay, you know, one of my favorite things to do people is score their market. So right now we're doing a huge data project of somebody wants a list of every financial advisor in the entire United States. I love doing that. Like sure, we'll knock that out of the park. Then. Um, B2B cold email is is basically the other thing. Niche specific, I would say it's obviously I like technology companies just have a great lifetime value for their customers. So that's a great niche to target because they, they're always in need of, of new customers and their cost of acquisition is pretty high too. So great, great niche over there. Uh, but then also helping startups either raise money or playing in the financial services game because um, that's a good niche as well, just for anybody listening, because in the financial services game, um, spam filters were literally made to stop people from soliciting financial transactions. And so in the financial services game, none of these people understand email deliverability at all. There, it, when you look at what companies have been around the longest, JP Morgan Chase has been around for 200 years. So if you could somehow get close to figuring out an offer that works for financial services people, uh, right now we have, uh, this is really the client who's figured out this offer. We are just the delivery mechanism of their, their offer. Um, but getting that's another great niche to go to. They've been around forever because they have such high profit margins. Uh, and so, yeah, B2B, always just cold email now. None of that hacky 
LinkedIn stuff anymore. Uh, content marketing is far, far more successful on LinkedIn than trying to hack together. I agree. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what I'm seeing right now. And I've got a couple of questions for you with regards to uh, essentially how you do it. But uh, B2B cold email, you've got a pretty wide scope of clients that you accept and work with at the present moment. And it's something that we discussed on like the, the previous call that we had, which we'll hop into after. But uh, with regards to the service itself, how did you work out your pricing structure for that? Is it performance based? And oh, uh, so actually, it is retainer based. I know we were talking in the beginning about scaling. Uh, so it is retainer based. Um, and again, it's all about frame control. Uh, I, my business partners talk about that all the time too. It's it's all about frame control. Um, and so I don't like taking on the risk of you know your offer, your clientele, your market, your opportunity, your competitive landscape. Uh, We're very upfront. Like, this is what you're going to get. Either you hire an SDR or you hire us and we are basically turbocharged SDRs. This is exactly what you're going to get. And that's actually a big, and I actually want to tag that on about a sales process too. We're very upfront. This is what you get. Do you want it or not? Go for it. So and, what's like a, what, what's like a custom proposal of like what you offer, for example, for uh, let's say yeah, it's actually it doesn't even have to be as custom as you think, um, because it's really just all right. Hey, come over here. So first we go over the email delivery structure. So okay, hey, I could get emails to land in inbox. You want to see? And then I just literally open up Smart Lead and seventy percent, eighty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent open rates. Okay, you trust me? I could get e- emails in in the inbox. Yes. Okay, great. Then we go over to Sales Navigator. Okay. Who who do you want? I'll get you the whole thing. Let's go. Because uh, people who don't know, Lead Turbo and Lead Hype make that ridiculously easy to scrape down a whole a whole market. And this is what's crazy is like that's so valuable to companies. They'll literally pay fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to a company like MixRank or Core Signal to be able to get access to this data. And if you just wait a little bit. Lead hype and lead turbo will get you the same exact data. Crazy, but we don't. I could talk about that forever. So then, basically saying, okay, look, this is the data. We'll get all of these people. Everyone who has a valid email address, we'll get for you. Okay, cool. Now here's the copywriting. We know it converts, but also what sells people on the copywriting is the personalizations that we can add. I would say for sure. Um, I've got a whole list that I'm working on with Clay.com uh, that uh, w- I-, I could send an email that will make you think okay, they looked me up. There's no way that they automated this, but we automated the hell out of it. Um, and maybe we could talk about that later. But sure. um, but yeah, so then that that's kind of the sales process. Oh, so going into that. So that's kind of how we frame the proposals as well as the sales process. Because then the other thing too is I see so many people, the biggest mistake I see people making in their sales process is they hold back too much information and they say oh well we have this proprietary method of doing this and and everything and you're you're very good at doing the latter where it's just hey even if we never work together this is everything you need to know and that makes people feel so much safer actually that that's my favorite line alex ramosi has like all of these lines of you know i'll use this in a sales process use this in a sales process honestly if you just listen to somebody's problems and then you just say okay even if we don't work together here's everything you need to know and then you get into it Oh my God, you'll just like, people will turn into butter in your hands. So um, basically then just show them everything that's going to happen. Even if you feel like uh, you should show them so many things that you get scared that you think, oh my gosh, holy crap, they're going to just do this on their own because I just taught them everything and they're never going to do it on their own. They don't care to do it on their own. And if, even if they do, you just built this goodwill in front of them where they said, wow, Eric was right. He taught me everything. The same goodwill I have for you, where you, you taught me everything as well. Now it's like, now I think I've only ever paid you. I I think my lifetime value for you is probably $500. But, and whenever people ask, you know, where'd you learn this stuff? Oh, Kirill Crisales taught me this stuff. You know, which one would you rather have? Would you rather have, have me pay you $3,000? Or would you have rather me, you know, tell everybody that Kirill taught me how to do this? You know, and that's, that's kind mm-hmm. of the way I frame it for people. Right. Okay. Now, um, Two questions. So the first one is, again, going back to the first question that I asked, do you feel like there is a cap with regards to retainers as opposed to performance based? Because the trend that I'm personally seeing with regards to all agencies that are scaling past six, seven figures is that 
they will at some point realize that they're able to generate a certain type of result for a client. They understand the difficulty of charging a huge upfront or a huge retainer. So they'll try to mix it into some way that's, again, performance-based so that the client can hit those figures. And as the client hits those figures, the agency can hit those figures as well. Um, do you see that cap and what's your thought with regards to this? And is this something that you would do in the future, but you, you just don't feel confident about a certain industry and market yet to, to go fully performance-based? Yeah, so that last thing that you said is is probably really true too. Um, because I'm also, I was talking with somebody yesterday who is a cybersecurity company. Um, and I literally told them, this isn't going to work. I've never, I'd like this, it, no, it, cybersecurity is like people losing weight. You, you have to go in and tell them that now they have to care about their their cybersecurity posture. It's it's just not going to work. Um, I told them everything and I was like, look, it, it's, it would have to be a retainer. No shot. Cyber, cyber, cybersecurity is like, you only care about cybersecurity after you get hacked. After you get hacked. Yeah. yeah. And I was, so I was like, look, I've been down this road before. It's not going to work. And he was still like, all right, send over, send it over. And I was like, what like and so uh, but it's because of the sales process it's because of look i could get emails delivered better than you can i can collect more data than you can and we can personalize the emails up to you do whatever you want um so i agree so the trend that i'm seeing is a lot of people doing this paper lead model um but when you look at the really sophisticated agencies they're not doing that predictable revenue science belkins uh winning by design they don't have a pay for performance model they are all retainer so the only pushback i would have on that is i think a lot of the new people are doing that but i, I i'm not sure maybe i'm not just not as close to it but the only person that i can think that's scaled to serious seriously high numbers is probably connor robertson uh of of, of the pay per lead model i've heard whispers that that guy's doing a million dollars a month um and it, you know if he doing anywhere close to that good for him and if it's on the paper lead model even better for him um so i think if there were an in industry that i knew successfully every single time that this is what would happen then yeah 100 percent. we actually just discovered that uh three months ago there was somebody who wanted me to do like a gutter outreach thing for them. And I even told him, I was like, this isn't going to work. He's like, no, no, no. Just email the property managers. I, I just want to clean their gutters. And I was just like, dude, this isn't going to work. No way. Made it rain for him. He gets like 50 that's leads. The, a week. That's the local stuff. Yeah. 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 The local stuff that I was telling you about. The dude gets 50 leads a week and it was just nuts. And actually I would even, if all else fails, I would even probably just enter that business too, because I could acquire customers fast. And then he even asked me to find subcontractors to fulfill on those things. And I was like, oh, I just need to learn how to sell this thing. And I could just find the subcontractor the next day. So anyway, I kind of digress on that, but that would be an industry where it's like, yeah, we know how to make it rain over here. Uh, go pay per lead. Um, but since it is so broad and mostly what we sell is we're mostly selling an email delivery structure and a database. We're not selling meetings necessarily. And that's the frame that we stay in control of. Um, so, but yeah. How, it, do you, how do you charge the month on month with that framework? So from the framework of we'll essentially sell you a system that we can set up in one month, but then when it's month two, what do you sell on? You sell on the meetings, right? You sell on the leads. Yeah, you still – so then the other thing – yeah, you're selling them the leads. Um, but they're they're also basically bought into the fact that we're setting up this whole system for them and we're going to run it for three months and they are – You do three-month You do three month contracts basically. Yeah, three-month contracts, yeah. Right. So, um, so you know, how do we – like I said, it's all about the frame control of – I always frame it back to, look, it's either you – uh, you could go hire another agency, go hire Leadbird. They're great. Nick Abraham's an awesome guy. L love him. Go work with Cody Dufresne. Um, they're great people. Go hire them. They'll do paper lead models. Or you can hire an SDR full-time. Or if you like what we have, we have an email delivery structure. I've got data, and I can personalize everything the way that you want. What do you want to do? And we, we basically leave it up to them. The other thing, too, is being able to take a step back. And what a lot of people really like that we could do is, you know, People, I'll ask, okay, so what makes a customer perfect for you? And they're, they'll say, okay, a customer is perfect for me because they have Salesforce installed, they have 50 employees, and they have eight SDRs on the team, 
and their website mentions this keyword. Well, because of clay.com, we can do all of those things. And so that's another thing too, is when it comes to relevance, we can achieve far more relevance for somebody than just pulling a list out of Apollo and, and just going. So that I would say the, the other thing I maybe haven't mentioned so far is yes, the personalization, but also how deep we can go. Uh, like if you only want to target people who are hiring sales development reps right now, we have that data. We'll go for it. You know? Okay. Your hottest industries right now that you mentioned are number one, the, uh, the business, uh, businesses for sales so business flipping. Right. And then the other one is local. Yeah. So the, the hottest industries in the agency right now for sure is financial services and raising money for startups though. I, I would want to just be clear about that. The, where I see a ton of opportunity right now though, is this B2B local service thing, as well as, um, flipping businesses. Um, B2B local service, just because if you put that, e that restaurant personalization into an email on these property managers, they'll, they lose their mind. They all, they all know the restaurant. They all say, oh my gosh, I, yeah, I've just went there with my wife. Like they, their mind just gets broken. When you do that on tech people, they've seen it before. They know it's a gimmick and, and they know that you didn't, um, manually put that in. They know that you automatically put it in. So, um, the tricks that you can take that work on SaaS companies, you could take to local service companies and their they brains just break. They, they've never seen it before. Um, so I see huge opportunity in anyone who's working in SaaS companies right now to just go back to a boring business and do the same exact thing. You're still bringing them the same amount, same value, if not more sometimes. And um, uh, they've just like the people they're selling to have just never seen it before. And the business flipping, I actually went to an event I spoke at and they all they did was talk about you should buy a business instead of starting businesses. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And I was talking to people in the room and I said, you know, if I found you a business that you could buy, how much is that worth to you? And they're like, oh my God, that would like I would pay you a one percent commission on the whole sale, which the whole sale is three, four, or five million dollars. Um and it's so easy to do. Just I know I've generated leads for that before. Uh, yeah, like so you, so easy. If you ever send out an email to someone saying, "Hey, we want to buy your business," they're like, "What the fuck?" Like, let's uh, let's entertain the yeah, idea. Yeah, let's let's talk. So if if you want to start getting into this niche, get a LinkedIn Sales Navigator license or get lead hype so you can control the search on your own. Ratchet it up to somebody who's been running their business for ten years, and just go nuts like that. Like that's that CEOs that have been running their business for 10 years, blanket message them. Um, I wouldn't sell to business brokers per se. There's only 2000 business brokers in the United States or some, something low like Your that. License, you can find them all on. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they do have to have a license. Um, so you can find all of them, but I wouldn't even worry about them. There's private equity companies doing these roll-ups and, uh, so this is where it kind of, you, you can't be a fly by night marketing agency to do this stuff because they may be, I've ne actually never had somebody pay a retainer for it. It's always only been performance stuff. Performance. Um, and they look at 400 deals before they buy one. So you have to become like a mini broker for yourself and build these relationships and go straight to the private equity companies and be like, all right, who are you looking for? HVAC companies? Great. And then go back and then just go find those HVAC companies. And then if one private equity company is looking for it, there's tons of other ones who are looking for it. The they love way. HVAC, by the way. They yeah, love, it's like uh, for them, it's like it's like honey to bees. I, I know. Them. Yeah, they and so that's I learned that when I was working with Grant Cardone um, on the Cardone Ventures side, Brandon Dawson. Uh, they they were seeing all of the list building that I was doing. It was so funny. I had three monitors. I was in their office. I was doing crazy stuff. One day, I was even scraping um, every TEDx speaker that's ever existed. Um, I was scraping that with Scrapestorm. Uh, no, with Octoparse, because it was a video that you did. I was scraping every TEDx speaker, and uh, the, my computer was going crazy, because you know when you're scraping, like, everything comes up, and it, like, the, it, it just looks weird. And they were like, are you, are you hacking right now? I was like, no, 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 Jared Grant. Are you, the, the, are you, the, ha yeah. are you hacking? <laughs> Jared Grant, the, uh, the president, wants a list of speakers, so I'm, I'm just getting him a list of every TEDx speaker that's ever existed, and they're like, you should have You should have told them, bro, you should have told them we're hacking the database of TEDx. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, um, they did... They did one time, they were like, uh, hey, could you email all of the Grant Cardone licensees for this thing? And um, uh, they took me forever to get me the list. And so then they came back and they're like, oh, Eric, so sorry. We Here's the list. And I was like, oh, I already got it. And they're like, wait, how'd you get it? I was like, oh, it's on your website. I just, I just scraped it. Um, so anyway, uh, there's tons of people in the United States right now that they're running their business. They have no clue who they're going to sell it to. They have no exit plan. They're just going to retire and the business is just going to die. 
that's so that's why when i was talking to you on whatsapp i think the two biggest things right now are industries that have not been hit with the oversaturation of SaaS that still have high contract values so local service businesses is one and then helping private equity companies source new deals is the other because it there's such a huge influx and these guys don't know how to do it either. The last private equity company I talked to that was doing this, uh, they do direct mail. They don't, so their cost to acquire customers is like a dollar per letter, you know, so they're sending out five that, you know, they'll get to 5,000 mailers and get three people who come back and it's like just crazy. So, yeah. Fun. Um, right. So now the, 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 the juicy question. So, you're running a 50k per month MRR agency with so many clients in so many different niches, uh, so many different industries. The common denominator is essentially that they're all in B2B, right? Yeah, that's the that that's like the biggest common denominator. Is there another one? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, uh, right. for sure. Yeah, B2B. Yeah. How do you stay sane and how do you maintain a work-life balance? Uh, oh, yeah. so uh, I don't have a work-life balance. This is this is my biggest biggest problem for sure. Um, so, I, honestly, a better question, like gimmicks aside, how do you ensure the deliverables at a good rate for all the uh, for for all the clients that you have? Because even in my latest video on like watch this before you start an agency, I just mentioned it outright. And this is like what most of the SMMA people don't talk about. You're going to start an agency. You're going to get money hungry. You're going to close 20 clients. And then at some point you need to hire. If you don't hire because hiring is a whole fucking art on its own, the clients are just going to turn around to you and be like, the deliverables are shit. We want a refund. Yeah. And Cause you're in the service business. You're going to give them a refund. Cause yeah, that, yeah, exactly. And I, I would always lean if anybody's asking, like always lean to be refund, um, refund trigger happy, by the way, just, just do it. It's just way easier. One, two, um, uh, so staying sane. No, uh, <laughs> I've worked, I've worked 16 hour days this entire week. Um, so this is not anytime people are like, wow, you're like achieving all of the success and like this, that, and the other thing. It's like, no, no, it's, it's really not. Um, so we just hired a person, Audrey. Uh, so I guess with hiring, like it's, it's all about, uh, okay. So backing it up, sorry, I'm getting ahead of it. The solution is hiring, even though your YouTube channel is full of, you could use this automation, you could do this hack and get this thing and speed up your process this way. At, at some point the, it just hits the wall and you just, you can't do it anymore. Like you, you it, that's, that, that's what we're discussing on the call as well. Is the solution hiring or is the solution niching down and then finding those clients that you can generate the most optimal results for and just going into that market full force and just putting like horse blinders or whatever the fuck they call Yeah. It. So I, I still think even with then you're still going to have to hire somebody because yeah, for sure. Of course. So, but... so yeah, absolutely. So the, when it's, and so this is probably the mistake that I've made and I, I openly admit this is it's probably too custom right now. And that's why when I'm WhatsApp message you, I was like, Hey, here are the three opportunities I see, because those are kind of the things where I'm saying, Hey, you know what? I'm going to keep doing content marketing and I will only take on those kinds of customers because the deliverables are much easier to deliver on. And it's the same playbook every single time. Like there's, there's one campaign it needs, for what I promised for them, it needs 17 different personalizations. There's no point to hire somebody and teach them how to do that because in a month, we're not going to run that campaign anymore. Or if we do, great. But I've pulled, that's the other thing is when you're when you're managing these clients, the thing that I learned is some people will say like, we'll send a thousand emails for you or whatever, they'll, they'll kind of cap it. I kind of have the mind of like, well, let's just not cap it and just pull way more data than we think we need. So then we could always just keep this flywheel moving. Because the other thing too is as long as you're sending emails, you're still just going to keep getting results just by by sending. Um, so unless, unless your domain is like burnt out. Yeah, that's true. So then the other thing too is um, uh, I don't know what other people do, but we go nuts. I see other people setting up, oh, we'll set up five domains and we'll put three inboxes on each domain. No, we go crazy. I'll buy 35 domains put, and then put one inbox on each of those domains. Um, and then we plan on not using half of them. But it's just in case something goes wrong. I, I am basically covering my bases at all times that if something goes wrong, we have a opportunity to, to move to something else. Um, so in a lot of the ways, that's, that's the way that I do it. And then um, hiring is just, it, it, you'll, you'll just have to hire. Like even that gutter thing, right? I was 
three months ago, I was getting that guy like 50, 50 leads a week, right? So now, even if I were to acquire all of these gutter companies, like at one point, I would still run out of bandwidth of how many property managers I could physically manage. So then you just have to hire somebody, which I mean, I think me being resistant to hiring somebody is why I'm in this problem today. So I think the solution is definitely hiring. I've tried everything else and it's, it's not working. So we just brought on another person. Her name's Audrey. And what I've learned with that is uh, Audrey, I think was working at a coffee shop beforehand and it's, it's like crazy how well that she's doing. And so um, it's all about just trying and testing and then be quick to fire. And then when you like be open-minded to somebody who's just going to put in hard work, because I'd rather have somebody who's hardworking than somebody who's, you know, done all of this stuff before. Systems wise, from an agency perspective right now, uh, how many active clients do you have at the moment? Oh, I would say it's like, uh, I, I, it's all in notion right now, but I would say like 17. Fuck me. <laughs> so for, let's say for 17 active clients, but you have many... to, it's also like, some of sometimes they just want data and sometimes they just want the email delivery structure. So there's Let, also let's ways say for things. active, active campaigns, active, How many? active, active campaigns, five, six, maybe seven uh, five, six. active. Yeah. But let's because, say seven. Yeah. So let's say seven uh, to, to manage all those active campaigns on a monthly basis. How many hires would you need? Um, so how many active campaigns would you delegate to? Every oh, I, oh, that's a great question. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, when I've done Two. this math before, I've kind of found that in my opinion, you can only launch realistically one campaign per day. I was actually watching Nate Aston's video one time and he was like, I should just achieve one thing every single day. And that's all I need to think about. Um, so that's the way I would break it down is you can launch one campaign a day. And even then, like one campaign campaign a day is a lot. So to keep this going, that means that you'd have to be launching, you know, and when I say launching a campaign, I'm saying you get 2000 contacts together and then you launch it. So then in two weeks, you're going to have to relaunch it again. So I would say 10 to 10 to 12 realistically, because even one campaign per day is even crazy now that I think about it. So I would say like three campaigns a week. And so that's where I'm getting these numbers from is, is just what can you like mentally put your head around. And so I would say 10 to 12 campaigns per week is, is what it would be. So per hire, you would allocate 10 to 12 campaigns per week. See, that's another great question. No, because um, I don't think they would be able to manage that because they're just not as fast as me. So like Audrey, she's going to get five. Like that's, that's all that she's getting. Um, and so then uh I feel like that's my capacity, but then you have to, when you teach somebody else, it's going to be far less than your capacity. So five is what I would probably give. She might, she might surprise you. you never yeah, know. she might surprise. Well, and that's the other thing too, is so um, we're, with these financial services clients, like they, they're starting to turn into much more of our, of our bread and butter clients. And so they're also running kind of the same campaign over and over and over again. And once that starts happening, that because that's really where I want to get the agency. Because before I was kind of just like, sure, this, that, the other thing, you're, you're totally right. And now I'm kind of like, oh, if I could just like only run ma campaigns to property managers, only run campaigns to financial advisors, only run campaigns for private equity companies. Like, what if we were to just spin that up or only help companies raise money? So that was, to anybody listening, that was for sure the biggest mistake that I made was was going too wide. But I was kind of just money hungry. And I was just like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, this, that, I'll do that. And now definitely in this next iteration, I'm like, all right, how can we just niche down and make the deliverable the same for somebody that we can make it rain for? So yeah, all great questions that are even making me think back of like the math of that I've even made for myself. Do you want to get... Uh, do you mind discussing like hyper technicalities of like your email campaigns or would you rather not? Oh, a hundred percent. I'll give everything away. Yeah. Let's do it. So I just want to, I want to measure up like what I do versus like what you guys do with like a fully quote unquote productized version of it where you essentially just copy paste it across numerous industries. Um, let's kick it off with like the super basic stuff. And for the audience as well, 
uh, we're basically going to be going over essentially how to do cold email the proper way in 2022. Uh, first piece of advice is do not use cold email to sell uh, alternative supplements to a, uh, a cold audience that you've purchased. Oh, about oh my God. Food. I will tell you so many things. Not to, Okay, don't do that. Don't um, shill e-commerce things uh, exactly. to blind people on cold email. Don't email software engineers. They'll never respond to you and they hate you. Uh, don't what what would be my other just don't do don't don't do any personal marketing with cold just do yeah it, don't do it, personal it. marketing and don't cold email software engineers it's just not gonna work <laughs> yeah right. uh so that's why i stay away from all those product things there was one company that wanted me they didn't even want me to send emails they were just like could you just consult and just like help with us and there's nothing you can do like b2b at least i can walk up to somebody and be like hey notice you have 50 employees and you just hired samantha and it's how legal. is she doing it's, it's and legal. it's legal yeah there's and no but the amount of is nothing yeah and the amount of things that i can say about them like i said like you just hired samantha awesome um but i can't go and be like hey krill you know i know that you're a big fan of nose strips and so like do you also want to buy my my eye drops like you can't do that and it's just and so it's obviously spam you it's just ah uh, it's just a mess so yes do not do that I, all right that's, so that's the yeah, that, yeah. that's the that's that's the first foundation just to cover yeah exactly. i get these questions and like growth hackers inc like all the time like hey yeah. i just I, I found the natural version of viagra i want to cold email fifty thousand consumers i'm like bro no what the fuck no. nobody yeah nobody's <laughs> gonna do that no um all right so that's the first one secondly uh do you guys use zoho or g zoho right yeah zoho, zoho off of actually your um your data is why we went with zoho um i find zoho to be a little bit more i give credits to andrew hodukovich or whatever his oh, name is. oh yeah oh yeah. dude if he says that i just go with oh that makes that's even better if no, andrew bet, Hodukovic, bet, he's been in the game for 12 true. years like who, who are you well, i don't even trust myself sometimes i'd rather trust andrew if andrew he owns lead it hype out. he owns lead no hype, i know right? yeah oh yeah, yeah yeah he well yeah he owns lead hype and then he's got his own agency too um so I find Zoho, if you if you screw up a campaign, Zoho's deliverability will go to shit way faster than Google's will. But if you're running a good campaign, it, you'll never have a problem. Um, but Google will also lock you out more often. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. so that's those are kind of the trade-offs. So the way I see it is it's cheaper. And so exactly what I said too is we just go overkill. So if we do screw up a campaign, because you only really need to set up 10 or 15 inboxes for somebody, um, even 15 inboxes is, is a lot because you're talking about over 500 emails a day of just 10. Um, so we, we'll set up like 30. So we never run into that problem. Um, so anyway, yeah, Zoho uh, inboxes. Zoho, right. Yeah. Okay. For your automation tool, uh, what do you use right now? Smart lead. Smart lead. Why are you guys not using instantly? Vebav is my best friend. And uh, so that's like, top top tier the other one is the client access portals oh and then the, this other feature that he put into so that with the client access portals i hate people asking me what's the open rate what's this like how many have you sent like all i just i just despise that so smart lead he's got client access portals that you could see all of those things the other thing too is uh you can give access to other people to respond in the inbox so that solves nice. the problem of okay of like forwarding the email. You don't have to do that anymore. They just go into the, their inbox. It's segmented and you could just go there. The other thing that was really important to my partners too was um, he has subsequences that if you, if somebody says no, you can like kill the campaign. And then if somebody says a keyword like, yes, I'm interested, it'll automatically send them an email straight back. So you don't even have to manage those responses too. And so that was the biggest reason that we, so I have, I have three instantly lifetime deals. Uh, huge fan of Instantly. I was on their podcast. Nils is a great guy. And I even told him, I was like, look, the only reason we use Smart Lead is the client access and the um, the subsequences. Call me, you know, when when you have that set up. So yeah, that's that's why we use that. Right. Okay. The, you're probably going to laugh at this question, but I know that there's people in the audience who want to hear this. Do you use the website domain to outreach or do you set up alternative domains around the actual domain itself? Oh, oh yeah. Alternative domains for sure. Um mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of a best practices thing. Uh, I've heard of some people making alias works, like aliases work, um, like Ricky Pearl at Pointer Strategy. He will use aliases instead of separate domains. Uh, I, I just don't believe how that could actually 
be a thing. But yeah, we have actually a spreadsheet that it's like go domain, get domain, try domain. And like you just put in a, a company's domain name and it'll spin up 30 permutations of it. And then we just get all of those and then do a 503 redirect back to their domain. Okay. So, uh, the other one, do you rotate the domains or no? N no. So you have that video of that satellite strategy, which I, I really, really like. Operationally, it's just too annoying. So this is um, another thing that Smart Lead will do for you is you can go into the campaign and Smart Lead will tell you which can which inboxes are performing uh, the worst, and we'll just pull those out and then just put the uh, the like I said we're only using ten but we set up thirty because it's so cheap to set up thirty and we're on a retainer just take care of your client and just go nuts setting up setting up the accounts so we set up 30 we're only using 10 and we'll just rotate them in as we see the problems with them happen okay right so we covered uh the rotation strategy do you use uh what's it called uh spin talks or no so no i don't and i'm actually going to launch a huge e-commerce private equity campaign to just test this i've got 60 of my own domains uh, that have been warming since February that I've just never touched with them. I just was playing around with stuff. So I have 60 of my own domains that uh, have been warming since February. We're going to do a huge e-commerce uh, acquisition campaign because I know that uh, I know how well that campaign should work. And so what we're going to do is we're going to test open tracking on, open tracking off, spin tax, no spin tax, one link, two links, click tracking on, click tracking off. We're going to test all of those things probably in probably after my brother's wedding in, in another week. Um, so I will let you know if that really makes a difference, but no, we don't use it. Um, everybody says that you should use it. Uh, it. That's just another like operational thing that I'm like, we're still getting results. It doesn't matter. Let's just keep going. Do you track, uh, do you open track and click track as well? First, for, no click tracking for sure. Right. Uh, because then we just set up a UTM. And so I really don't like putting links into emails anyway. So I never exactly. really, but we set up a UTM because then that's, you can still check that people are, are clicking just by doing that. Then um, no click tracking, open tracking for the first week to just show proof that we know what we're doing. And then we, we'll turn it off. Then you'll turn it. Okay. Yeah. Then... If responses start going down, we'll turn it on for a day or two just to see like, oh, is this an inbox issue? And then once you see 30 or 20%, you know, it's an inbox issue, then you can do something about it. Right. Then uh, how many links do you include in the body of your email or is it text only? I, I... really try to do no links. If we're going to do a link, just one, but I really try not to do any links. Okay. Then for unsubscribes, unsubscribe links. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like your take on this. Uh, but I don't do your take. <laughs> so uh, what we'll do is, P.S. If this isn't relevant to you, just let just say not interested, and we won't email you again. That's the way we do it. Um, but I kind of go back and forth on this. So the reason I do that is because I'm putting so many personalizations inside of the email that I think the unsubscribe link gives it away that it's an automated email. But also I think people are also catching on to the fact that if you say that in the PS line, they still know that's an automated email. So I don't know. I, I'm thinking about probably going back to unsubscribe links because it'll definitely reduce the amount of people who are marking us as spam. But that's also why I put in so many personalizations. Like we're putting in like, like my follow-up emails are, are saying, Hey, you know, I was on, you know, other employees LinkedIn profile and the algorithm pushed me back to yours and it reminded me to follow up. So, you know, I just, you know, digging deeper here and then we'll say something else about the offer. Um, so yeah, but that, that's what we do. Perfect. Okay. Um, I mean, we're, we're pretty on par with regards to what we do and how we do like I yeah. agree with legit everything you've mentioned, which um, is why in the beginning I said, everyone should just go through the growth hacking bootcamp. The technicalities are there, all there. Don't reinvent the wheel. You've done it. I've done it. We're, we're, we're all doing it. We're all doing the same exact thing from a technical standpoint. Just master copywriting. You should only focus on like list building and generating really, really good lists and copywriting. Don't worry about the technicalities. It's all there. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. So I've included uh, I've included a link to the Growth Hacking Bootcamp in the live chat. And uh, Eric, when did you join us? You joined us like a year ago. Yeah, so it would have been March or February is when I joined. So, yeah. Right. Um, that was, I'm trying to remember the content that we had then. That was when 
I was still pushing cold email with G Suites. That was before I, I turned. Yeah, you're G still doing G Suites. Some of your some of your tutorials still included GMAS as the sender too. Um, right. So, and that was actually still when you had videos on there that would take like 15 minutes before the uh, the actual stuff would start. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I try, man. Uh, no, no, yeah, I, I completely <laughs> understand. I still watch, you know, it didn't make a difference. Right. Um, right. So that's, uh, that's that part. The other part that I also wanted to go over is essentially your LinkedIn content marketing. Uh, oh, yeah. Like you, um, it seems like you've got it down to the T. Like, what's your biggest advice with regards to it? Is it engaging with other people on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it actually having a posting schedule? How do you how how do you make it work? So first, you have to come from a frame of reference of what gets engagement on LinkedIn. For some reason, there's only two things that get engagement on LinkedIn. Uh, one is these kind of posts that are like, "Oh, if this person came into my office, and you'd never believe it." They didn't even wear a suit, but I still hired them anyway. And, you know, like those kind of like just exactly. th those those BS things, like they still get great engagement. Um, or the other things that get great engagement are if you can post something that somebody will read and th like the level of expertise that you put into the post is at a level that they only know five other people in the entire world that can make that kind of post. Those posts will do well on, on LinkedIn as well. And so... Basically, the way that we test to make sure that a post that we do does that, um, we have three tools, Taplio, TweetHunter, and Repurpose.io. Um, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit. Uh, but specifically for LinkedIn, what we do is um, I spam tweet things. So I'll go on uh, on TweetHunter, I think it is. Maybe it's not type oh tweet hunter so sorry i'll go into tweet hunter sit down saturday sunday sometimes even a friday whenever i'm in a content creation mood um and i will just spam tweet things and i'll just set up three tweets a day just tweeting whatever i want to tweet then whatever performs successfully on twitter gets turned into a linkedin post because it's way easier to come up with a short form content thing and just like spill it out and then if it performs well on Twitter, and like I don't have that many Twitter followers, so when I say perform well, I'm like if anybody engages with it, we're making a LinkedIn post. Um, and then we'll we'll turn it into a like, and then now we have the list from the week before of what worked, and then we go longer form, and that's what I turn into actual LinkedIn posts. Um, you and I we were both testing TikTok at the same time, I think. And uh, for anybody listening, like. TikTok was crazy. I was posting three videos a day for a month as a challenge, and I really need to get back into it. I um, I got connected to probably like 20 people on LinkedIn because they, we were all B2B people, and like we we made good friendships there. I was featured in the New York Post. Um, I, uh, I don't even know. I think I gained like 1,500 followers in a month or something. It was just like the engagement on TikTok was just crazy. I just couldn't keep up with it. So then what I would just – include there too is uh, repurpose.io makes it really really easy to post a tiktok and then automatically turn it into a youtube short automatically turn it into a twitter video automatically turn it into Insta instagram reel a facebook reel and then what we'll do then which we haven't done in a while because i haven't done video content in a while is um then the best performing ones we'll push those to linkedin as well but so on repurpose.io it's set up automatically that if i if i post a tw tiktok it goes to instagram facebook youtube and twitter automatically then the best performing ones get put onto linkedin because that's just the the highest value channel and i don't want to make sure i want to make sure i'm only putting good things up on it but that's so we do this testing ground thing first sh of short form easy to produce content and then we'll turn it into something else after so for linkedin you essentially pre-test on twitter and then uh -huh. whatever goes off, you also post it on uh, on on linkedin as well yeah for tiktok the 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 biggest challenge that i saw on tiktok is basically the algorithm's ability to like I'll give you an example. Like on YouTube, I sometimes create like the weirdest of videos, like how to scrape a website of like property sellers and renters that are going to get like 200 views. But over time, it's essentially going to add up. TikTok doesn't have this prolonged discoverability feature, like the search. Nobody searches this type of stuff on TikTok, not yet, at least. Yeah. They might search like Dubai or top places to eat in Dubai. And it's actually working right now. It's picking up where like TikTok SEO is actually becoming a thing. But for such niche down topics, it doesn't really work. Also, on the flip side, the 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 actual algorithm itself is good, but it's not as good as 
being able to connect a piece of content about how to optimize your SDRs as a manager to a wide audience where you're going to get 50, 60 K views. Like that video is going to get like 200 views. And it's basically the first tranche of TikTok testing your content against an audience to find people that are interested. So I feel like people that are like deep in the game, like me, you, etc., and all the other people that are in the industry as well. It's really hard for them. Even if you look at, you know, Neil Patel. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, he killed it on YouTube. He's got like, I don't know, like two, one mil sub, two mil subs, give or take. And then on TikTok, he's like, a, last time I checked, he was on like 15K followers, maybe even less 6K. Yeah. So the, the switch is really, really hard for, from a content creation, uh, content creation aspect. You need to keep the content very general and broad. And for some people it's, it's not interesting to them. Yeah. And so I even started getting into so I totally agree. And I even started getting into trends that I was like, I can't post this on LinkedIn. Like, what am I doing? Yeah, exactly. Why do I keep doing this? Like the, and when I say I was getting into trends, I wasn't dancing or anything, but what I was doing was um, uh, like, there was this one sound where it was like somebody being like, you didn't know that there's a tool for this, but there is. And I would basically not even talk. And I would just play that sound. And I would be like, and the text I would put was like, have you ever wanted to do this thing? And then I would put the tool in those videos would perform like crazy. Like I, I did one of, uh, automate have you ever wanted to automatically like your girlfriend's uh instagram posts and then i just put text out up and the, the, it got like thirty thousand views it was crazy so yeah it has to be general and it has to be very eye-catching the other thing that i think about with tiktok is actually i find that their algorithm once their algorithm has found your niche it will keep putting you so the way i didn't get connected with all these people on linkedin until two to three weeks after starting my experiment, that's where like everything picked up. Cause I feel like the TikTok algorithm found my people and then it went out and it started showing it to, to my people. So um, I really like it for that aspect. And what I really like TikTok more for is the fact that I know, cause I see it with myself. If I watch somebody's video and then I view their profile, but I don't follow them, you're, you will still get pushed their videos. And that's what I really like about TikTok is that like, even if they don't follow you, it's kind of like they're ghost following you and you can keep pushing things to them. Um, but you're right. It's the discoverability is way less, but um, also once it finds your audience though, it will keep finding your audience. And the way I know that is because I was hiking one time and I somehow got a chipmunk to come up and eat uh, a cracker out of my, my hand. Yeah. It was kind of crazy. Posted on TikTok, it got 150 views. On Instagram, it got 35,000 views. And so that basically told me, yeah, that basically told me, oh, TikTok has me figured out. And I posted something that my audience does not want to hear from me about. And they, 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 I didn't even get to 200 views on it. You know, like that's the, the usual tranche that you'll get. Um, but on Instagram, though, that was much more wide open. So that's my other learning that I took from it is if you're going to, talk about something on TikTok, niche down and never stop talking about it and don't go off. And if you're going to go off, you need to make sure that like maybe probably just start a new account. It'd probably be easier. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my learnings from TikTok. When are you going to start a YouTube channel? Yeah. So um, for Clay, I'm uploading their videos right now. I'm, I'm doing all of their, their things right now. I actually think that a YouTube channel is my next thing. So what I'm going to do is continue my content hierarchy so twitter is where we have like all of our low level spam kind of content of just like whatever i don't even want to call it spam but anything in my brain i just dump and just see what happens then we go a level up and that gets turned into a tiktok and a linkedin uh post and then whatever performs really well on linkedin that's what i would want to do youtube videos about but i think i would probably still take your channel's direction because um don't 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 you, really you don't think so because don't I, it's uh, like the i've been like doing youtube like for the past quote unquote two and a half years give or take and like i've just hit like 5k subs so yeah, even if you, but even, but so look, i mean e like even if you do it uh you'll even see in my upcoming videos my video that style you're still switching i'm changing it drastically because yeah, the previous true. one doesn't work it's so limited right? yeah that's true because you I, I even asked you about this i was like Dude, Alex Berman does an email teardown, and he literally takes some guy's email, turns it into a four-sentence thing, and then burps at the end of the video, and then he'll get 20,000 views. And then I'm like, dude, you just taught somebody how to scrape the internet, and <laughs> you'll get, like, 
two thousand views. I'm like, what? Like, what is this? And we even talked about it. You're like, it's just general audiences. It's just the the different way that they. So yeah, I get. So when I say I wanted he to runs say, ads, he runs ads on his video. Yeah, he well. does do that too. Yeah. Well, and so that's actually so. The other thing that I want to get into as well, which I'd love to talk to you about, is um, I know that I can acquire customers with outbound, and I know I can acquire customers with content marketing. The next thing I want to go to is is ad placements, and I think YouTube is super interesting because if they hit skip on your ad, you don't pay for the impression. So uh, that's definitely YouTube ads and TikTok ads are definitely some of the next things that I want to. I know you've got that actress working for you right now, which I think is so funny. Uh, but she, you know, if if she's killing it, she's killing it. You know. No TikTok, uh, TikTok ads are fucking insane. Yeah, uh, I'm legit running solar ads right now, and I'm getting, I'm getting UK-based solar leads for fourteen euros per lead, basically with email. Yeah, phone number, if you can figure that out, and, just so you know, if you so, can figure that out in California, in California it's worth two hundred and fifty dollars. That's uh, the issue with TikTok ads, basically. You're uh, because my company is registered in the EU. I can only run ads to the European Union and the Middle East. If your company's really? registered in the US, you can't run ads offshore. If your company's registered in Australia, oh. you can only really advertise within. Uh, let's uh, let's use my LLC and let's let's do it. Um, I, I just want to see, like, uh, I you know, I'm very very curious. But um, but anyway, back back to. What we're talking well, about. We need to get a we need to get a new actress because this one has a this one has a an English accent. But yeah, it's crazy the type of shit you can get on Fiverr. Honestly, I um, <laughs> I swear it's it's nuts. It's mind blowing. Um, that's that question. Let's hop over into the FAQ because we hit an hour and this is gonna be a bitch to edit if it's longer. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, so first question from. Gabriel, do you think with the recession coming up, being in the business of helping other people sell products slash services will make it harder to deliver results or no? I don't really, I don't understand the concept of this question. Do you, being in the business of helping other people sell products slash services will make it harder to deliver results or no? Um, so yes, it, it's, it's going to be tough for everybody. Right. The same way it's going to be tough for you to acquire customers, it's going to be tough for everybody to acquire customers. Um, but this is where you separate the men from the boys. This is just, you know, that's all I really have to say about that. Is are you going to double down and keep going, or you know, are you going to pack it up? That everyone is going to get hit. Right. Uh, next one: How to find emails on a on a specific situation? For example, emails of organizations with running marathon clubs. That that this was something easy. Yeah, what I would do is I would just scrape Google. So um, use Google search operators to just rotate through uh, running marathon clubs uh, and then rotate through by location. So uh, open up Scrapebox, do like uh, in quotations, put running marathon club um, and then spin the location. So running marathon club, New York City, running Mar marathon club, Jersey City, running marathon club, you know, whatever, and just spin the location. Uh, and then you scrape box to extract emails from it as well. Yeah, that's. I would you do it any other way? Um, it, it's super easy to find locations with a certain characteristic where, like the the impossible scrapes are essentially companies that are actively looking for app development, for example. Unless yeah, that's like that's like next level. Like it's, yeah. it's close to impossible, but. Uh, uh, specific things with specific characteristics as opposed to intents is very, very easy. Uh, how to find emails of companies with a specific, yeah, we already answered that. Can you do a mix of both retainer and performance? Yeah, yes. sure. I, I, that's no. the other thing too, is like you're in control of the whole deal. Like, yeah, do that and say like, Hey, we have ongoing monthly costs. Just cover our ongoing monthly costs. Yeah. He charges three months challenges. Actually, wait, hold up. Before we get to this question, have you ever considered doing that? So like your actual retainer of like i don't know three five ten k and then performance based deal to follow it like because that, that's what i meant when i when i was mentioning the actual company scaling to six seven, oh eight. oh i see i wasn't i i'm not referring um, to like hey we'll generate leads for you for 25 bucks i mean like there's a setup fee of course and then for us to scale and you to scale and for us to have a aligned interest with your guys to actually growing your business i still i still would only do it in a niche that i you know, know yeah right. and i know the results that are going to come because other because that's I, I tell everybody that i'm like have you ever done this before no and if they have done it before then i'll be like like literally there's one company that used the the system and they 3x their conversions so like i know that this works so um 
it's like so when they've done it before you can kind of base it off of like look i will improve this and i can guarantee that i'll improve this but if they've never done it before and you've never been in that niche why should you take on that risk and i guess that's just the way that i see it um but if it's a niche that you know 100% uh, actually i would never even do just straight paper lead it would it would have to be a retainer cuz i wouldn't want to take on somebody who can't even afford uh of course but yeah absolutely 100% of course uh sounds like you feel it'd be easier to serve a hundred percent agreed yep that's, that's whatever would you should just find that niche go crazy until you do and that that was the biggest mistake i made because you can productize there's yeah. not so much variation so yeah, when you're yeah. hiring as well when you're telling them take care of this campaign and this campaign you're like oh it's like the campaign i did yesterday sure not a problem but if it's like work this out and run a test to see if it converts and make sure it doesn't land in spam and the industries are like totally different there's just so much more variation for for you and for the uh, for the individuals taking care of the campaign web design agency to get them clients Oof. i use Apollo for leads and got real estate clients it's time consuming how can i get more leads fast what's the so your solution is basically instant data scraper for for, for apollo yeah so i right. what will you do is scrape apollo with instant data scraper and then use clay to find the the emails because they've got a great um finding email so what figures. is clay because like I, I've, been, I've been willing to ask this question throughout the whole oh course. yes so data clay, enrichment? yeah so clay is like a spreadsheet on steroids so uh you can take a list of any kind of inputs or you could even use their tool to find the inputs or well our tool i work for the company find your inputs from linkedin or whatever or you could even just put in a person's name title company we'll find their linkedin profile for you we'll find their website we'll find what website technologies they're using their web traffic um all of these different things. So like basically if you watch Nate Aston's videos of like all the data enrichment things that he's made before uh, in Integromat and all the APIs he calls and all of those things, that's basically what Clay is. What's the cost per enrichment basically? Like let's say for every lead you it, get in, how much would you pay? Yeah, so it costs uh, at this point, it's like point one. It's like a point zero one seven five per enrichment right now. So it's like, uh, less than two cents per enrichment. Is it cheaper than Hunter's growth plan? Yes, that would be che uh, cheaper than their growth plan. No, but that's not even our highest plan either. So, oh, growth. Oh, yes, it is cheaper than their, their growth plan. What's the URL? Is it clay.com? No. Clay.com, yeah. Um but it's in uh, it's in beta right now, right? So you yeah. can't uh... okay. Well, we're kind of in beta, but like we'll take anybody that wants to get off the wait list, off the wait list. Bro, get me in. Um, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today. Yeah. I might pull a might might make a YouTube video for you guys. Sure, yeah. For free. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So next one is easier to service. Well, right. Did we answer his question though? So No, you... uh it's time consuming. How can I get more leads fast? Um geez. Web design is just really tough um would you say it's tough because of the oversaturation yeah yeah exactly um i know one offer that i've heard is somebody who is basically like they'll go out to local service companies they outbound on them and they say hey you know we'll we'll build your we'll build you a sample website for free just say yes and then they've got like a stock website that they just change some images out and they say if you like this we can make it even more custom for you and then they they do that um that's a nice way yeah that's a, that's a pretty good way to do it um but this is a very oversaturated thing that it, it's it's pretty tough to do all right uh yeah so rl uh did you look into using gpt3 to process responses did you because i i so, have a like GPT no so to but... process responses it's way too wonky in my opinion like you just have no clue what's going to come out on the other end of it um clay just clay just put in an open ai integration that i'm playing with um straight into the product um that i want to try to personalize campaigns for you know, uh, that's the only GPT-3 that I'm playing with right now. Usually when I even personalize uh, things, I, I don't even let GPT-3 do it. I just say, like, I just want this snippet, and I want to say the same thing about the snippet every time, because sometimes GPT-3 will get a little wonky. Yeah. Then, Lester, what does the three-month contract for cold emailing include from a number of emails point of view, and what are you charging? Yeah, so it's like three to $5,000 a month. Uh, and then the amount of numbers... 
we that's the thing is maybe we should cap it but we don't we just we'll just go crazy for you so you don't you don't cap the number of emails that you're going to send yeah unless it gets really nuts um but does the client care because i think they just care about the end result of how yeah exactly so they yeah. only care about the end result and i seriously care about the end result so because i see some people being like oh we'll send 1500 emails for you and i'm always like well what if 1500 emails only gets the five meetings you know so that's why we'll mm-hmm. kind of just go crazy um what is the best place for starting growth hacking for someone who's not technical but loves copywriting? Uh, growth hacking bootcamp. Don't yeah, but if it, that's like the divide that I'm having right now because I have uh, I've had students that are not technical like hop in and they don't even know how to use the actual like course platform and I get like crazy questions like how do I maximize? How do I open the video? So like I feel like uh... if, if you're not technical with regards to the use of like computers, if you if you're not like fluent with browsers just watch the free content that Eric and I produce. Like I, I, yeah. I produce on YouTube and Eric also if people YouTube. aren't that technical, like Google works really well. Just exactly Google it. And then if you guys are technical, like if you understand what scraping means, etc., then definitely growth hacking bootcamp. The link is in the live chat. Uh, Arthur, do you handle the single inbox for no. your clients? No, no. It's just, as soon as there's a positive response, that's on them. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you looked into the model where um, you're basically selling the booked meeting? You take care of the responses as well, or no? Mm, I, I operationally, I just don't really want to handle that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I just bubble up the the positive response and then take it from there. I do apologize. I do have to run to another call. So, um, I'm actually 15 minutes late. But um, if we would just want to. Any other questions we could do like rapid fire and then we could always let me see if there's any other short on ones in your experience. Best way to capture CTO's attention by cold email. Do you buy the domains on behalf of your co- this is a pretty easy one? So this one. Yes, we buy them. Perfect. Set. Sign it up and just yeah. All right, bro. Thank you so much. I think it was a pretty no, good session. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. This is so much fun. Cheers, bro. I'll text you on WhatsApp right after. Yeah, cool. All right. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.